Okay, so the plan for today is to continue and uh, perhaps finish our discussion of uh, the treasure game, which allowed us to explore a little bit JavaScript and how we build the backend for, for JavaScript. Uh, to remind you, this uh, treasure game, we, we display this matrix uh, with hidden treasures, and you click on the treasures until you find one. And what we did last lecture, we added a backend to this game that's mostly written in, in JavaScript and runs in the browser. And the backend had two functions. Uh, first, when the game starts, JavaScript was making a request to the backend to get the initial game parameters, the dimensions of the matrix and the percentage of treasure. Then uh, JavaScript would take over and we control the game until you find the treasure. When you find the treasure, JavaScript would send a message to the backend with your score and expect the backend to reply with uh, new game parameters. Okay? And where we stopped last time was, uh, uh, so in, in my script here, where uh, I've written updating the score uh, JavaScript. Essentially, we have just uh, seen how you implement the backend part of updating the score. And then we were going to uh, continue. So I have only a little bit to show in terms to complete the game. I have to show how we do the JavaScript request for updating the score. But then this will give me an opportunity to spend some time on something that I think is extremely important and fundamental in programming. That is asynchronous programming. And it's something that you need to understand if you're using JavaScript. And uh, in fact, pretty much any UI framework you may want to use, Android, iOS. Uh, and also, if you use Node.js in the back end, you will need to understand asynchronous uh, programming. So we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of that um, in a bit. And then there's one more element I want to cover, uh, this time with the back end. Uh, there was some, you will, I'll show you that there's something really not very good <coughs> the way that this back end is written. And I need to introduce one more element. So that will take us uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps to the break. And then we can move on to, uh, to other topics. Any questions about where we are and where we're going? Okay. So, um, OK, let me uh, first show you a little bit of Python code. And by the way, as I explained last time, this kind of development requires us to switch between uh, JavaScript and Python. And these are uh, very different uh, you know, frameworks, very different languages, and very different concerns. So if you get a little bit confused, uh, don't hesitate to stop us and, uh, and ask a question, because it's important to keep this straight. So this is a, a little bit of Python code. This is the backend code. And the backend receives requests. Uh, so essentially, all I wanted to remind you, this is something we've seen last time, is uh, how the backend processes this request to the URL API game new score. And this is what happens when the game ends and JavaScript will send a message here. So let me remind you that we discussed that there are multiple kinds of requests. Get requests, post requests, and others. Uh, in this case, we have decided in our design stage to use a post request to update the score. And do you remember why we said that the post request is better than a get request? Okay, one more people to wake up slowly. Okay. The data isn't sent in the URL. The data is not sent in the URL. Uh, that's not the, the most important reason. That is true, but it's not uh, the main reason. There's something special about uh, get requests that, that makes them inappropriate for requests that change the state of the server, change something in the state of the server. In this case, the total score and uh, how many games you play. The user can manipulate the get request. This is true, but you can manipulate the post request as well with a little bit of code. Uh, it's not an important reason. Over there? This post means creating something? Post means creating something. This is also true, but it's more of a convention than a fundamental reason. Okay, let me explain it again. 
Get requests are the, the default kind of requests. This is uh, what the browser will do if you type a URL, if you click uh, a URL. And when the web was designed, uh, get requests by convention were specified that they can be cached and they can be issued multiple times. It's perfectly fine for a cache in between your browser and the server to issue a get request on its own to refresh its cache. So the convention is that you only use get requests if the request uh, does not necessarily have to go to the server, or if it gets to the server, it may go multiple times and nothing bad is gonna happen. Example of get request is getting a file or an image from the server. Okay? You can request it multiple times. The server is not going to mind. You get the same result. You can even request it zero times if you have it in the cache. And again, the application works. This is not true with requests that update the state of the server. Like when you press uh, buy on a, a shopping cart or in an account, you say make the transfer. Or in our case, update the score. These requests have to get to the server. They cannot be cached. Nobody's allowed to cache them and they cannot be issued multiple times. So you use post requests for that. So you use get only when it's safe for the request to be cached, okay? It's, it's, very, uh, it's very important. Any questions? And we're gonna discuss a little bit more. There are more kinds of requests, and then there are more conventions for how you use them, but this is per perhaps the most important one to use. Do not use get if this is a request that changes the state on the server. Uh, which is obviously the case for our new score. Now, post requests, uh, they, this, this particular request sends some data, sends the score. And we discussed last time, there's a little bit of uh, code that you have to put in there to decode this data. You have to first find out how long it is, using a header content length, read that many bytes, and then we know that this is gonna be encoded as JSON, so we use this JSON library to turn it into an object that we can then use. Next, what you have to do is the actual work of updating the state. So you have to increment the number of games, the number of columns for the next uh, game, um, decrease the treasure by 80%, fractional treasure, update the total score. Okay, so that's some state management. And then uh, you have to prepare the response. And this part is pretty much the same between get and post. You'll create the response with the status code, a content type, uh, and then you get the game parameters that you need to send in response, and then you convert them to JSON using JSON dumps, dump S, and then write it uh, to the TCP connection so that it goes back to the server. Okay? So this is pretty much what the server does. When, I, when you're going to be using Django and Rails, you don't write all of this stuff. You'll write this stuff because this is very specific to what you're doing, but the framework will do the rest, the preparing, the, preparing the result uh, and decoding the request. I just wanted to show you, that that's why we don't use a framework here, is so that we can see more of what happens. Questions? No questions. Uh, let me now, um, okay, so I want to show you the JavaScript counterpart to this. So this is implemented in uh, Treasure 35, and uh, in fact we can play it if you want, well, I need to start the server. Oh, server is started, uh, version 35 of the server. Uh, load the game, and notice that very fast as I press refresh, um, the game has loaded. Refresh is actually relevant to our discussion of get and post. If the page, if the current page that's shown here was obtained through a get request, which it is because I just typed in its URL, so that's a get request, the browser will not hesitate to refresh the page if you ask it. Because it knows a GET request is always safe to send back. If, however, this page you obtained from a POST request, like the confirmation page after posting a, a transaction to your account, bank account, and you, if you press refresh, the browser will pop up a window saying, are you sure you want to refresh this page? Because it was obtained with a POST request. And POST request, you can't just you know, refresh many times because the server may do the operation multiple times. Okay, you've seen those uh, pop-ups, okay? They come from essentially post requests. Um, so we, we can see in the network communication here, the network panel, if I, 
make it um, so you give me a second here to organize my uh, the the font is so big that it's hard to fit too many things in here okay so if I start playing the game well I was lucky I, I found it in the first request notice how in this list of network requests, we have this new score request, which uh, you can expect it, and you see that you see the URL API game new score. You see that it was a post request, and in fact, if you go to the <coughs> bottom of this panel, you will see that this was request payload. This is what the browser sent to the server, and it sent this uh, JSON string representing an object with one field called score and the score equals three and um, you can look at the preview of the response this is what the backend responded the backend increased the number of columns six decreased the number of fret treasure from 30 percent to 24 percent and notice that javascript not only has made the request which we've seen but it has also interpreted the response and um actually has it Oh yes, because it has six columns now, the, the, the matrix. So let's look at how, how you do this in JavaScript, okay? So this is JavaScript code. Um, and uh, let's walk through it a little bit, and we're gonna see it again uh, in, in, in a bit, because we're gonna discuss it some more this, in this lecture. The first thing that JavaScript does, uh, this is when you click, when you click a cell. This is the handler for clicking the cell. So first, it removes the CSS class covered. And remember, this is how we achieve the showing of the, of the cell. Because only if covered is set, we have this uh, orange background. Otherwise, the background goes away. We increase the number of attempts. We log something to the console for <coughs> debugging. And then, if it has treasure, then we compute the score. Essentially, the game is over. We compute the score uh, by subtracting attempts that you've made from the attempts that were expected based on the fractional treasure. And then you make this AJAX uh, request. We've seen this last time as well. This is a jQuery command for making a request to the server. And we've seen this before in the context of the initial request that we make to the server to get initial game parameters. This is more complicated uh, because it's a post request. The post request typically has more, more stuff going. So you have to specify the URL. You have to specify that this is a post. If you don't specify this, it's going to make a GET request. GET requests are always the default. Then you specify the data that's being sent with the request. And uh, so first, you're preparing this dictionary uh, with the score and the key score, and you're calling this uh, function uh, that's built in in JavaScript called json.stringify. This is how you convert a, a JavaScript object into its string representation as JSON, because what you're sending to the server is just a bunch of, uh, just a string, a bunch of characters. You, you tell the server that this is going to be JSON. Content type, this is an instruction for how to process the response. Because uh, this function will issue the request, and then when the response comes, it will unpack it. Uh, and since it's told it that's application JSON, it will interpret it as a JSON string. And then here, what we have, and this is the, the interesting part, this is how you tell jQuery what to do with the response when it comes. This is very important. Uh, it will take a while after issuing the request and the response coming. But in one go, in one call to this function, you tell it how to make the request and what to do with the response. And you do this by passing in a function that takes the response as argument. This function will just wait, will sit there until the response comes, and then, then it will run. And what it does, it actually looks at the response and extracts the parameters that the server has sent, rows, columns, fraction, treasure, and then it calls our JavaScript function that construct the data structure and render the map. Okay? And then I also have this alert uh, to fire, uh, to well, declare success and uh, communicate the score to the user. 
We're going to discuss this some more, but so far, do you have any questions? Yes. Can I zoom in a little bit? Can I zoom in a little bit? Yes, I can. Sorry, you should have uh, interrupted me for something like that. Okay. Um, by the way, I, I, I fully expect that you would uh, go over this at home on your own time as well, okay? Because uh, you can't possibly get all the details from the lecture. Okay, so let's play a little bit with this code because um, um, actually before we do that, I want to kind of switch gears. So th this actually completes the, the, the game. We have the full implementation of JavaScript, we have the back end and you can play the game and after every game this function runs to communicate the score. Everything works fine. The paper you're referring to is the same thing you were showing us, right? Um, the paper, this paper, is the HTML. This is called readme backend.html, which describes the steps that I'm going through and much of the stuff I'm telling you. Okay. This, pa this has references to this file. Okay. Um, Okay, let me switch into, yes, question. Um, so the data that the post request responds with automatically fills that parameter response? Yes. Yes, the, the data that you receive from the server will automatically arrive as a response. And this is part of the magic that jQuery does for you along with the browser. Okay, jQuery will take this function and will, will remember it. When the response comes, which is going to be a few milliseconds later, then this function is going to be pulled up and is going to be invoked on the response. Okay, this is very important. Like I, I, I see questions on Piazza that relate to this. But we're going to spend uh, you know, maybe 20 more minutes uh, discussing this because it's, it's very important. So let me switch a little bit into asynchronous programming. Um, so with that code in front of you, I want to... Um, <coughs> to kind of sketch on the board, how would you program a similar operation in a, in a language like, like Python or Ruby that use synchronous uh, communication? So what you have to do is you have to issue a request to some other server, sending it some data, <coughs> the score. And uh, when the response comes back, you have to do something with the response. And you also have to pop this alert that you want. How you'd write this in Python? You would say, uh, send request. Let's say you have a function that you wrote, send request. And you give it the URL, API uh, game new score. And uh, maybe you even give it the data to send, let's say the score. Okay. And then most of the programming you've done assumes that when you call a function that does something complicated, the execution uh, does not proceed. Since when this function is eventually done, it's going to return to you the response. Okay. And then you, call, you do something, do something with the response, and then you alert that you want. This is synchronous programming. And it's synchronous because the execution of the function that calls send request does not proceed. It waits here until send request does all of its work, which may mean waiting for a response to come from the disk, from another server, from whatever, from a database. Okay, And it's easy programming because you don't have to, uh, you know that this function will return when it's ready for you to proceed. And because of that, because this function only returns when it has the response, it can return to you the response as a result. And then you can uh, do something with the response. So you see, you read the code in a very sequential way as to how things happen. Okay? Make a request, wait for the response, do something with the response. When you finish doing something with the response, that's when you alert. So the sequencing of the step, it's very, very easy. OK, so this is called synchronous programming. And it's what you've been doing. Uh, JavaScript does not have synchronous programming. It has something called asynchronous programming. And uh, it only has 
asynchronous programming. Okay? Other languages, Ruby, Python, you have a choice. By default, you do synchronous <coughs> programming. But it's possible to do asynchronous programming in Python or in Ruby. It's just not common. Uh, Node.js, because it's JavaScript, it only has asynchronous programming. So really, you cannot avoid it if you, uh, if you use JavaScript. How do you do the same things in uh, asynchronous programming? Well, you make the request to a URL, giving it some score. But in asynchronous programming, all of these functions that communicate to outside systems will not wait for the response to come back. They will issue the request. It will send the request and return immediately. Okay? So these functions uh, always return very fast. Because of this, there's nothing it can return to you as a result. It does not have the response. Because the response, maybe the request hasn't even arrived at the server by the time this function returns to you. So instead what you do, you tell the function, Issue the request, and when the response comes back, do this with the response. So you're passing the what to do with the response as a, um, as a function. So you, you pass maybe a function that takes the response, and you do something with it, with the response. Perhaps the same thing that you've done here. Notice how you're using uh, functions. You pass around functions. Uh, these are called callbacks. And they are really uh, something that's very common in asynchronous programming. And then let's say you do alert, the alert that you've won. OK, so if you write this code in JavaScript or in Python with, uh, with an asynchronous send request, the send request functions will prepare the request, will send it, will remember this function, and will return. And before this function runs, before the response comes, you'll see the alert. Because the execution just keeps going. And then, a few milliseconds later, while you're in the middle of who knows where doing something else, the response comes. And then this function runs. Do something with the response. So the order of the events is suddenly a lot less predictable with asynchronous. Uh, also, the structure of the code is a little bit strange. Because while well, here, uh, you can simply say that this is 1, 2, 3 in this order. In asynchronous programming, it's not so easy to read the order. It's 1, then 2, then 3. But it's not the sequential order that's in the text of the program. In fact, you cannot even be sure of the order of 2 and 3. Because if this communication is so fast, and the response comes back so quickly that the execution hasn't even arrived here, this may happen before the alert. And in fact, in some executions, it may happen in one order, some execution in another order. Uh, questions? So I'll, I'll now demonstrate this uh, live with our JavaScript. Yes. What happens if you want to use data from the response after that call? Very good question. So what happens if you want to use data for, from the response, let's say, in alert? Okay? In synchronous programming, easy. You just use the variable response. In asynchronous, program, asynchronous programming, not easy. Anything that you put after send request does not have access to the data. You have to put the alert in here. Okay. Everything that needs to use the response or needs to happen after the response arrives has to be in the callback. And uh, some of you asked the question, Piazza, make get request from the smart project. I want it to return the response. It can't. Make get request returns before the response even has arrived in your machine. Okay? So the response is only available in the, in the callback. Uh, let me. Uh, I'll now open the same JavaScript file in the inspector. Okay, uh, this is it. I will make this game smaller because we don't need, need to look at it. And let's look a little bit at the sources. We're going to recognize the same code that we looked at. And I want to put some breakpoints. 
Uh, this is breakpoint uh, when I make the request. So it's one. I want to put a breakpoint when the response arrives. This is the first, uh, the first instruction of the callback function, which is called success in here. And I want to put a breakpoint in the alert, which is uh, three here or two here. Okay. And now let's. Uh, I'll play the game because this code only uh, runs when I win the game. Okay, I won the game. First, the breakpoint hits the AJAX call. This is the beginning of making a request. If you look at the network panel, um, let me clean it. Okay, it's clean. Back. Uh, I, I let it run now. I press this, uh, this button here. This resumes execution. Where do you think, uh, which breakpoint will be hit next? <coughs> The alert. Okay, very good. So we we'll click. The alert breakpoint has hit next, even though this is after the AJAX call. But if you look at the network, uh, there's actually a re look at it. It's interesting. There's a request new score in that panel, but it says pending. Okay, we can switch to the terminal window. It has actually arrived at the server. Well, because we're stuck in the, in the debugger. So it has arrived at the server. Perhaps immediately after uh, we stopped at the alert breakpoint, the server does its job. It sends the request back. But as far as JavaScript goes, the request, the response has not been uh, processed. It says status pending. Okay. So we're stopped at the alert. I now press go ahead. So the alert is going to pop up. Okay. And then the response. Uh, uh, hits the breakpoint. So this does not fully demonstrate the order in which the response arrives, but it demonstrates the order in which your JavaScript runs. Uh, you see that we were stopped on the alert, waiting to press OK. Well, during that time, the server has received the request, has processed it, has sent the response. In fact, the browser has received the response, but it hasn't yet delivered it to JavaScript. It waits for the alert to be done, and then uh, it will run this callback. And now the, the game continues. So on. Okay? Uh, questions? How many of you knew this stuff? Okay, so it was useful. Some of you say this. Okay. If you have more lines of JavaScript under the alert, at what point will it then return back to the callback? Very good question. If I had more JavaScript here, the way JavaScript runs is it never does two things at once. Okay? It first goes through all of this code, issues the request, runs the alert. The alert is actually synchronous. I lied when I say JavaScript doesn't have anything synchronous. The alert is synchronous. Okay? It will stop here until you click OK. Then it will execute the rest. And only after that it will see, is there anything else I can do? Maybe somebody has clicked on the button while I was here. Or maybe a, re a response arrived. And it will pick one of those things and run. It will run all of this code from the handler. And only when that's done, it will look at some what other callback it can run. Okay? So in JavaScript, you never have this interleaving that you have in other languages with multi-threading. Uh, all handlers run to completion, then some other handler runs to completion. This is, in, it, 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 I cannot even emphasize how important this is. If I write here a loop while true print something on the console. This will never terminate. Your browser will freeze. It won't take any more clicks. You won't receive any more responses. In fact, at some point, the browser will pop up a window and say, unresponsive JavaScript. We want to kill it. Okay? So you can really do uh, bad things with your user interface if, uh, if your code takes a long time to run. And this is one reason why JavaScript doesn't implement synchronous programming, because you cannot afford to stop JavaScript execution until the server deems to respond. This may take a long time. It may never come. OK, uh, other questions? OK, I want to show you uh, one more thing. Um, I, I'm going to open uh, Treasure 36 which is a slight variation of this uh, 
And what I've done, I've, I've modified, just for the heck of it, I modified the initial <coughs> request, that uh, request initial game parameters. I, uh, in, I, I turn it into two requests. Let's say that our game specification says that when the game starts, you have to make two requests to the server. So there's the first, uh, I'm printing before request one, so that we can see in the debugger the order in which things happen. I make this Ajax request, and in the callback for when the response comes, I print receive response one. Then after this Ajax call, I say after request one, before request two. Scrolling down. I make another Ajax request. <laughs> and uh, I ignore the response. All I do essentially I print receive response to. And then I have after request to. Okay? So essentially I've taken this and pretended that we have to do two send requests. In synchronous programming, they all happen one after the other. And execution blocks essentially. In asynchronous programming, that's not the case. So what do you think will happen? Uh, let me decrease a little bit the font size just so that we can get more of it together. So what do you think will happen in the browser when I run this code? Before request one, then after request one, before request two, then after request two, and then wrap um, the two callbacks. Uh, then this one and this one. Yeah. OK. In either order. In either order. Very good. Uh, so let me repeat that. Execution proceeds from top to bottom. So before request one, this request gets sent out, but you don't have the response. Then you go come here after request one, before request two. Then you send, you prepare this request to go out, but you don't have its response. And then you print this. Okay, and this will happen very fast, no matter how slow these servers are, because you don't wait for the response. And then after a while. When the servers respond, you may get this one or this one in either order. Typically, uh, because this is all on my machine, you're going to get this first response and then the second uh, response. Let me demonstrate to you, and then, then you can ask some questions. This, this was uh, 36, I believe. Um, and I, all we're going to look this time is at the, at the console. Look, before request one, after request one, after request two. And then a little bit later, uh, I'm not printing here the time, but we could look at times as well if you want. Received response one, and then received response two. And if I try many times, actually, all, every time I get response one before response two, but don't fall for this. This is an accident. Just because you made the two Ajax requests first and second, it doesn't mean the responses are gonna come in that order. Even though when you're testing, it will always be like this. So don't write code that assumes this. To demonstrate this, let me stop the backend. And I'll stop, I'll, I'll use the backend 36. This is a backend that I hacked a little bit, and I put a random sleep in, in the response. So essentially, the backend gets the request and then sleeps between 0 and 1 seconds randomly, which is a realistic thing that may happen you know, in the net. So if I now refresh the page, look, I received the response to before, before one. Now I received response one before response two, okay? And this is what you're gonna see in real life, okay? If you make multiple requests, they all get scheduled. We can't count on uh, when they come back or if they come back. Any questions? Okay. How, what if I do want these requests, the responses to be processed in, in, in order? Or I need maybe the response from the first request to make the second request. Say it again. Very good. So, as always, if you need this code to only run or to depend on this response, you have to move it all in here. Okay, so I did that in uh, uh, Treasure 37. <coughs> so 
So notice how the second AJAX call is in the callback function for the first AJAX call. So AJAX and then after request uh, one, and in the response, I say response, receive response one, before request two, after request two, receive response two. So this is all serialized now. I'm making the first request, and that's the only thing I make. Then I wait for the response, and then I make the second request, and then I wait for its response. Okay, and we could run this, and you will see that indeed it has this uh, sequential behavior. Sequential behavior is good for, uh, for uh, the programmer because they can count on the order in which things happen, makes programming uh, easier, it's more deterministic, things happen the same way on your testing machine and in production. Why do you think this is bad? Maybe bad. <coughs> right, this will take longer. In, in the previous setup, the requests were being sent in parallel. One, let's say, to Google Maps to get a map, and one to your server to get some score. And they'll all take, let's say, 200 milliseconds. In 200 milliseconds later, you have both responses. This one, you're dependent, I mean, you wait until the first server responds. If the first server is slow, everything will slow down. Okay? So asynchronous programming, in general, gives you access to more performance, because this ha this, everything runs very fast, and you can run things in parallel. Here, you cannot run things in parallel. You have these threads and a lot of other stuff. Questions. This is the, what I wanted to tell you about asynchronous programming. It's, it's a, a tricky topic, but a very important one. You have questions. It's all clear, I hope. OK, well, uh, you'll have to practice it. And you will have to practice it, because JavaScript is all asynchronous. So let's take a, let's take a break now, uh, a couple of minutes. And I'll put up uh, the usual puzzle.
You have from this model, you don't have to construct the case. Like what we've done in, uh, in here when we uh, update the score. So it should look very similar. Are there any questions about uh, the project? Mechanics of how we're doing? Just out of curiosity, do you have the statistics of like how many groups chose each platform, each framework? Off the top of my head, uh, in past years, uh, it's almost half-half uh, Django with Rails. Um, perhaps the Django a little bit uh, smaller, uh, and very few Node.js. Maybe two out of 20 teams, which is Node.js in, in the past. Um, <coughs> Node.js, uh, it requires you to do asynchronous programming. Uh, there, are, there are two advantages to it. One is that you have one language. Uh, in the front and the back end. Solidity is the same tools, same development environment. Um, the, the disadvantage is that sometimes getting your head around these callbacks is a little bit tricky. The other advantage is, in general, for asynchronous programming, it gives you access to practically unlimited performance. So it's, it's a lot harder to scale a Django or Rails application to millions of users than it is in Node.js. All high-performance servers uh, are asynchronous, like Nginx, Memcache, you name it. Anything that's really high-performance in the back end, web servers, um, are using asynchronous programming. It's just a harder, slightly harder program to set. Other questions? OK. Uh, we, we have a deadline on Monday. It's really, I'm, we're trying to kind of uh, encourage you to get started thinking about your big project, even though you're all very busy fighting JavaScript for, uh, for the smile. Okay? You have to get started on the big project. Um, and we'll give you some structure. Um, any thoughts about this, uh, this puzzle? This is uh, an interview question um, that I've encountered. Uh, let's say clarification questions, if you don't understand the statement. Right, so you climb the mountain one day, you go down the next day. Is there a point on the mountain where on both days you arrive at the same time, like say noon or whatever? Well, I don't think this counts for the beginning and the end. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that for all points. Is there a point? Yeah, the beginning and the end are both points. <laughs> no, 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 but uh, in the first day, you are, you are at the bottom of the mountain in the morning and at the bottom of the mountain in the evening. So it's not the same time of the day. Oh, yeah. Yes? Um, intuitively, I think if like the burning strings problem, and like if you light the strings at both ends and then you like you can wash them, they'll like you can stop them at some point and like they'll be the same time. Yeah, that's and then you can translate that to this So your answer is yes, that yeah. there is a time. What other answer? The way I think about it is if you, if you have a graph and uh, like the y-axis is the time, like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and then the x-axis is the path, you're going to be going like, like one like increasing and one decreasing. You're going to cross somewhere. So this is time? Oh, no. Sorry. Y-axis is time. OK. This is bottom and top. Right, so on the first day, you start at the bottom at 8 a.m. And uh, you go at various speed, take a rest. Oh, this is not taking a rest. This is uh, infinite speed. Um, <laughs> so take a rest, and then you get tired. Uh, again, tired is like this. Um, and then the second day, 
you start uh, uh, 8 a.m. at the top, yeah. and now you somehow make your way down, you get to the bottom at 8 p.m. And uh, yes, it, it has to be a point where these curves intersect. It's the same, it's the same explanation as the burning strings, essentially. Okay, good. Uh, nothing to do with computer science, but computer scientists um, like people who like challenges like this. Okay, let's... Um, okay, so there's one more thing I want to show you. And this is, again, I'm just scratching the surface in terms of web apps. We're going to learn more during this semester. Um, although I won't be teaching explicitly to how to build backends, how to build frontends. Uh, you will have to kind of learn a lot of the stuff uh, on your own. We'll be looking in lecture at higher level issues about software engineering in general. But there's one thing that I wanted to demonstrate to you, um, because you may not appreciate it with such a simple application, this, uh, this treasure game. And that is uh, managing the, the state. Okay? Let me switch back to the Python code that manages the state in the back end. Uh, this is a version 35. And I'm going to go to the top of the file where. Uh, zoom. Say it again? Perfect. Okay. Um, so this is the top of my Python file that implements the backend. And this is a poor man's keeping, remembering the state of the game. I just created some global variables with all my four fields. And then uh, I have this function that picks those that we need to send back uh, to the client. Okay, so this is state management. And there's a little bit more code in the rest of the file to increment the states and, and so on. Uh, and this, as you've seen, it kind of works. As the game progresses, uh, you get bigger and bigger uh, maps. But it's a very poor way of, uh, of managing state. It, not only because you've heard global variables are bad, okay? Not because of that, uh, or not only because of that. It's, it's for another more fundamental reasons, uh, reason of how web services work and how, how the web was designed to work. And the important thing for you to remember is that you cannot guarantee that the server process, the, the, the process that has served the first request still exists when the second request comes. Uh, what do I mean by this? So let's say that uh, you, when you start this Python file, you create a process, and it sits there listening on a port. Okay? And the process has memory, and in memory have global variables. And everything is fine if this process lives a long time. But web uh, services don't live a long time on purpose. Or sometimes they crash because there are bugs. And that's fine. The web is designed to accommodate the crashing server, as long as you restart quickly another process. Uh, the more important reason of why you cannot count it there is because the way you really run web services is in front of this process, you have what's called a web server. And examples of this are Apache, <laughs> Nginx, and, uh, and a bunch of other uh, no, uh, web Brick, I think it's called the one for uh, Rails. Uh, Django has a built-in server for, for development. This web server gets the request. This is the one who's listening on the proper port. And then the web server will be told to run many processes, many backend35.py, many of them. And it will know how to talk to all of them, and it serves the role of load balancing. Okay? This is how you get to a million users. It's not because I can change my Python file to deal with a million requests a second. I can't. I just run 10,000 of them on 1,000 computers. And I have in front of them hardware and software that every request as it comes, it gets sent to the one that's available. This means that one of the requests can come to one process, next request comes to another process. Global variables, no good. Because each one will have a different 
version of your shopping cart. Okay, that can happen. On top of this, web servers are programmed to kill these processes periodically. After 10,000 requests, we kill it. Because it's better to start a fresh one, clean. Uh, so these things come and go. If you have, you can have a feature of auto scaling. If you notice more traffic, more of these pop up. If you notice less traffic, you kill them. And then you save money when you run them on, on Amazon. Okay? But the bottom line is do not count that two consecutive requests come to the same server or the same process. So you cannot keep state like this. And how do you think you keep state? If you can't keep it inside here, you have to keep it outside. Persistent storage. Persistent storage, You're right. Most commonly a database. You put a database which runs in its own process and all of these talk to the database. So your shopping cart is in database. It's never in the memory. I mean, only temporarily in the memory of the server. So you get the request, you go to the database, read the shopping cart, update it, write it to the database. Next request comes here, they get access to the same thing. And the database is really optimized for many accesses, concurrency, all that stuff. It's a pretty big uh, beast uh, that does the job well. So as you can see, our backend.py, it's a very naive uh, implementation. And what you do, uh, in, in fact, you can demonstrate this very easily. So I run here this game. Uh, let's play one more. You see the state changes. I get more and more. Uh, a bigger thing a map. If I refresh the page, it seems that it has memory. It gives me the right state. But if I kill the server and restart it, um, why is backend? Oh, backend 36 is the one with the delay. It's OK. It will lose the state. It took a while because it has the delay, but it gives me the back, back. So it lost the state, as you would expect with global variables. Uh, so instead, I have backend 37, which I will invite you to uh, look at. This one, okay, it also has state, but it, it has state even if I kill it. Uh, let, let's play one more game. I'm unlucky here. Okay. Um, so if I kill it and restart it, I refresh the page, it has the state. And why does it have the state? Well, I'll show you. I didn't implement the database because I just want to demonstrate the concept to you. I, I created this class, persistent state, which uh, essentially writes the state to a file using JSON. Okay, so I, I take the state that I want to remember, package it as a JSON string, write it to the file. Next time I need it, I read it from a file. It's a poor man's database where I'm just using the file, the file on the file system. And I can actually look at it. Um, this, is, this is the state. This is what gets saved. It's a JSON object. Okay? Not a very good idea, even this one, because if you have multiple of these writing on top of the same file, uh, it can get corrupted and such. And that's where a database comes in. In case you wonder why Rails and Django force you to use a database even for something so simple as a hello world. It's because really you shouldn't even think of um, not using a database for writing a web app. This okay, questions? Okay, so this completes uh, the hands-on presentation of CSS, JavaScript, backend. Uh, I touched on asynchronous programming. I touched on why we need the state and databases and so on. Um, I have uh, essentially uh, just five more minutes that I want to use of your time uh, in terms of general concepts about uh, <coughs> web apps. And then we switch to something that's uh, software architecture, essentially how do you organize code. Uh, so for the, this next uh, part, I want to switch to PowerPoint. And actually, okay. um, so I have a couple of slides. Let me stop and restart the recording because I really don't know what.
to discuss something called uh, REST. Okay, uh, so I want to tell you a few words about conventions for how you pick these URLs for services. In the old days, URLs were very uh, natural. Uh, they came up very naturally because the first part of the URL contained the server name and then it was a directory structure for where the file was, the file that you wanted. These were web servers that all they did is they gave you files that they already had. When we started to construct web services that return data, which they manufacture on the fly based on some contents of a database, the URL does not make such natural sense anymore. It's not a directory structure because you're not using files. So you've seen that for our game, we actually made them up. We said slash API, slash game, new score or not. We use get versus post. The question is, can you make them up willy-nilly? Well, one answer is yes, you can. The web allows you to do that as long as you get your JavaScript code and the backend code to, uh, to understand each other. You can, you can use them uh, as you want. Pretty much the only constraint being the get versus post discussion that we have. So that's something that you have to follow. But what you put in the URL is much up to you. However, over time, people realize that this is a design question that comes up uh, again and again for everybody building an application. So they ask the question if there are some principles that you can use to construct URLs in a way that's fairly uniform across apps, makes it easy for people to kind of pick up a new convention. And one of those conventions is called uh, REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer. So to be specific, this is not a uh, universal solution. All URLs are going to be designed like this. But it's something that comes up pretty common, especially when you have an application that stores various kinds of things. Uh, for, let's say users. Um, we will look at some conventions for how to construct the URLs for creating a user, for deleting a user, for uh, fetching the data for a user, or updating uh, data for a user. And I'm going to do that on the, on the next uh, slide. But first, I want to talk about the request type. We already discussed get versus, uh, versus post. And I hope that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, the REST convention puts a little bit more structure on top of this discussion. Everything we said still stands, uh, but there's a little bit more structure, and, and it introduces more request types. Um, put, delete, and, and so on. Okay. And the convention that you should remember is that get request may be cached. The browser may cache them. Your ISP may cache them. Uh, this web server may cache them. Okay, so they can be cached in many places. They might not get to your application. So use post when you're making state changes. But let's now discuss this uh, REST uh, convention. Uh, so in this table, I'm showing different kinds of URLs and for what kind of purpose uh, they are typically used, uh, corresponding to the different kinds of requests. Okay, let's first look at the first line. The first line shows some characteristics of these request types. So get, use get when there are no side effects, no changes on the server, just fetch, just reading information. Put is a request that will not be cached, but it, nothing bad happens if the request uh, is issued multiple times to the server. So that's called item product. It's OK to send it twice. The result will be the same as if you send it once. Uh, post should uh, post you cannot it's not allowed to uh, cache or to send multiple times delete is another request that generally by convention can be issued multiple times and nothing should happen so how do you use this uh, so let's say that you have uh, multiple kinds of entities on your server users uh, you can have uh, items uh, shopping carts whatever by convention, uh, if you use uh, slash users, with, where this is the name of your entity, and you make a get request, uh, that's by convention a request that should return the list of elements, the list of uh, items of this entity. So it's going to return a long list of, uh, of users in this case. If you use a put request with the same URL and with some data, it will replace the entire collection. 
So put request on users without specifying a specific user. It's a way to kind of overwrite the entire collection. Post request on this URL, this is how you create an element. You have to also pass the data for the element, but this is the URL, and it will return the element and delete uh, deletes the entire collection. So essentially, uh, if you if you use this name users, uh, which in your application is the name of an entity, uh, all of the requests refer to the entire collection. If you want to refer to a specific element of a collection, you put a slash and some identifier of that element. Let's say the identifiers are numbers, you write user slash 15, a get request gives you, gets you the data for one element, a put request updates one element, post is not used in this format in general, and delete request, is this is how you delete one element. Okay, so these are URLs that refer to one element of a collection. Furthermore, if you want to specify an action on an element of a collection, let's say increment uh, grade or update grade of the user, then uh, typically you use get or post request, depending on whether this request is uh, has side effects or it's a read-only thing. So you use get if you want to retrieve some data, uh, and uh, a post if you want to make some data. Yes. At the level of a collection URL uh, in post, it says create an element. Does that mean uh, create an Sorry, I did have to say it again. Uh, uh, in collection URL, at that level, um, in post, when it says create element, return element, does that mean create an element in the collection? Yes. Yes. So this means how to create an element in the collection. This is how you create a new user. Okay, and you will notice in the, the way we created the smiles uh, URLs, they're kind of following this convention. You make a post to smiles, slash smiles. And if you do a get on slash smiles, you get all the smiles. And if you, we didn't give you, uh, we didn't ask you to implement something like this, smiles slash 15 to return one smile. Or a put request on smiles 15 to update one smile. Um, so how would the, uh, so, at the level of element, wouldn't update the element in the collection uh, sort of be able to create if there isn't an element? Or no, you cannot use this to create because this actually the URL specifies, identifies the, gives you an identifier for the element. So Typ um, typically these identifiers you, you don't have when the element doesn't exist because they are generated by the server. You cannot ask two clients to generate identifiers that they may actually uh, collide, may create the same identifier. Yes. What's the general difference between a put and a post? Um, so th this is a, a convention that some, some caches will, uh, will, will make a difference between them. Posts are, they don't, nobody touches posts. They don't suppress it, they don't issue it multiple times. Get, everybody want, tries to uh, cache get. Put and delete, uh, it's a little bit uh, in the air. So much of this is a convention, I should say. Uh, in fact, there's many web services out there that don't follow these conventions. This is more of a structure. Uh, furthermore, it's a structure that makes sense when you have different kinds of things that have identifiers and that have actions in them. But some websites are not like that. Uh, some websites need the URL for making a change to many different kind of things in one go. Okay, that kind of falls outside. Uh, I, I personally don't use put uh, very much because uh, it's very rare that you need to replace all the smiles in one go. Uh, typically, I need to update one smile. Some people say you should use put to update one smile and send the whole new smile again as you send it when you create it just with updated parameters. But more often, I just need to perform a very specific kind of update on the smile, in which case I, I create a URL that's still specific to this particular element, but you know, I add something here to say new score or a like to increase the like count, and then I perform a very specific kind of update. Convention uh, more than anything. But that being said, conventions are important to software because if we follow conventions uh, as much as we can, it's easier for us 
to start from working on another project. It uses similar conventions to what we used before. It's easy to orient ourselves, even though the project would perfectly work if it doesn't follow these conventions. Any more questions? OK. Um, one more thing I want to tell you about REST. And this is, again, a convention thing. How do you return errors? So far, we've discussed how do you issue commands. But when something bad happens, how do you return errors? There are two options for returning errors. One is to take advantage of, of the HTTP <coughs> status code, which has to exist in every response. And remember, 200 means, OK, you did it. Uh, you did what they asked you to do. Uh, 404 means uh, whatever they asked you to get uh, was not found. 403 means some permission denied errors, and, and so on. And if you look at the uh, HTTP status codes, there are you know, uh, 20, 30 of them defined. Um, and they all have some generic meaning like this, not found. Now, not found is sometimes the perfect thing to return. Let's say somebody wants to look up a user and you can't find it. Okay, you could use 404. Uh, but I personally, and in fact, many people say this is what you should use. You should always return uh, status codes. I personally don't do that for various reasons. One is I find that sticking to these specific error codes Uh, uh, I feel it's limited because they were designed to apply to many apps, but they only apply so and so to my particular app. So often I need another one that's not there. And then I invent uh, 545. Uh, okay, that's one possibility. The other is I personally have been burned uh, because these some of these error codes are interpreted by the various uh, entities that uh, process the, the request. For example. Most web servers will log the 404 errors specifically uh, and separately. But the 404 error, it's not a bad thing. It's something that actually happens quite often in the operation of my software. I'm just going to be polluting my error log with things that are not errors, really. Uh, and I've had other issues as well. So the option that I use, and in fact, I designed the smile uh, error reporting around this option, too, is to say, <coughs> unless Unless the server really crashed, in which case the web server, so if the server crashes, this process crashes, well, it doesn't get the chance to specify a status code. It's the web server that's programmed to put the 500 error code uh, in there. Okay, So in that case, OK, you're going to get the status code of uh, 500. But if your backend actually gets a chance to produce an error code, a status code, it should use status code 200, meaning, yeah, I process the request. And inside the request, I create a, a, a convention for how to specify the errors. And I can invent my error codes specific to application. I can send error messages. I can have one errors or a list of errors, as you've seen for smiles. It gives, it gives me a lot more freedom. But then I had one student uh, ask, look, I got the 200, uh, and my own success handler got called, which means that the request succeeded. Well, not necessarily. Look inside the request, and if you see an indication of an error, uh, even though it has a 200 status code, it's, it's an error. It's just an application level error. It's not an HTTP level error. Any questions? No questions? OK, so we discussed the rest. See how you can take advantage in your application, but don't, you know, uh, don't take it as a religion. It's, it's a convention. And then. Uh, status code, you're free to use whatever convention you want for, for your application. I'm just giving you uh, some options. Uh, I, I'll go quickly over encoding of data. Um, I just want to point out that in the Smiles project and in the Treasure project, we've sent the data back and forth using JSON. That's only one of uh, the many possible conventions. And in fact, at the beginning of the web, um, so JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It, it was invented along with JavaScript. But uh, the web was invented a little bit before JavaScript. And people were using XML. This was a format of choice of representing data. Uh, so, and in fact, this X from XML survives in the word AJAX. The X at the end stands for XML. AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript XML. 
So, uh, but nowadays people use AJAX and then send JSON. But you could send uh, whatever you want. Uh, in fact, there are many more formats than this. Uh, not as popular and sometimes proprietary. Uh, Google invented proto buffers, protocol buffers. Uh, it's a binary format. It has the same information as here, but a lot more compact. Because you could say, uh, look, why should I send these, you know, quote title every time? Because this can be a convention between me and the server that the first thing I'm sending you is a string. Okay? And this 15, okay, it takes four bytes to represent as a string, plus the spaces, plus the column. I can send it in four bits. Okay? So uh, that's where you get with proprietary formats. And sometimes it makes sense to use them. We use them at Conviva. Uh, we have our own proprietary format. It just makes the data a lot more compact. And we save a lot on, on storage, because we store all of the messages that we get from the clients. And it's, it's terabytes. OK. Uh, uh, moving along. Uh, we did talk about backend state. Uh, in your project, you'll have to actually learn how to uh, set up a database, set up tables, and all that, so that you can implement this, uh, this persistence layer. I'm not going to teach you uh, about databases in this class. Either you've learned it in the database class, but uh, actually you can pick up most of that stuff on your own. It's not so hard until you get to really high performance uh, requirements for your application. To summarize, uh, we finished this kind of uh, part of the course that uh, tries to present web applications. We looked at HTTP. We looked at uh, we looked at CSS. We looked at JavaScript. But for the backend specifically, uh, one thing I want to point out is that if I said I scratched the surface on CSS and on JavaScript, it's true, but it's a lot more true on the backend. On the backend, I I practically gave you just 1% of what backends are. And in this class, we're going to learn a little bit more. But really, you'll have to go get access to real production application to see all that the backend can do. There's a load balancing, uh, caches, and a lot more stuff. At the end of this uh, course, I will have a couple of lectures to give you an idea of how do you take your application and make it run 24-7 million users simultaneously and do updates while it's running. Okay, that's, that's uh, where uh, soft engineering really starts to pay off. Okay, um, so that ends this, uh, this slide deck. I was going to start on the next slide deck, which is about uh, software architectures. And let me just get started, um, give you an idea of where we're going. Okay, I'll only do two slides. Okay, so uh, what I want to sh talk about next is something that you will need to uh, deal with fairly quickly in your design stage of your application. Uh, that is, how do you organize your software? When you write smiles or treasure games like this, it's one page of code, two pages of code. It's not that important to put the, uh, the, all the pieces in the right place. But when it gets uh, big, it gets to be pretty important. So you have to start thinking about how to, organize, how to organize your code so that you know where to find it when you need to change it. And that's the, uh, that brings us to the concept of software architecture. This is the highest level of design of your software. Now, I'm not talking about how you break things into functions or how you organize within a function, or even classes. It's a very high level. What components? This, this kind of level of boxes and how they communicate. And uh, so at the highest level, the SMILE project that you've done and uh, the treasure game that we looked at are client and server. So there are two main boxes, the front end and the back end. Okay? So, and that's pretty clear. And uh, since we even program them in different languages, it's pretty hard to confuse them, to mix them up. Because there are two separate files, two languages that run in different ways, different uh, parts. But going a little bit down uh, inside these boxes, in both of them, the JavaScript part and the backend part, and you look how I organize the code in there, and you realize that in both cases, uh, there's not much organization. 
uh, I kind of built it up, you know, as I uh, was going. Uh, and you will see that typically we can start to recognize in these applications different kinds of aspects of the application. There's state management. Uh, how do you store the data? How do you represent the data? And uh, what operations you do in that state? How do you increment the score? How do you implement the light count? How do you sort and so on? And that's completely different from issues like presentation. How do you present it? How do you show it? What colors? But even, you know, how many of them? Those are all presentation details. And we kind of mix them up together. Furthermore, there is communication. In uh, uh, both the front end and the back end, we have communication issues. The front end communicates the back end. The back end communicates with the front end and with the database. Uh, we want to typically keep those, uh, keep those separate. Okay? So the architecture, if you want to give it a name of what I did so far, it's called spaghetti architecture. And this is uh, perfectly fine for a small uh, you know, project. And it's what you do if you don't think about uh, architecture. Starting next, uh, next lecture, we're going to pick up from here. And I'm going to actually zoom in into our treasure game and point to you where the state management is, the presentation is, the communication is. And then look at an architecture that kind of hoists them apart, separates them, and uh, it's going to make your applications a lot, a lot cleaner. Okay, that's it. That's it for today. I'll see you next uh, week. Meanwhile, uh, we're going to be getting your uh, smiles back, I assume. They haven't been up. Which slides? Oh, give me a chance.